The scripture reading for today comes from the 15th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. There are three things to note that might help us better hear the message of the passage. First, as you will hear, at the beginning, Jesus crosses over into a foreign territory and interacts with a woman described as a Canaanite. That is, she was not of the people of Israel, like Jesus, and she was not a cultured Greek or a powerful Roman. The feeling of the story is something like if a Russian man crossed over to Ukraine and talked to a woman who was a field worker, or dare I say, if an an Israeli crossed over and talked with a woman in Gaza. Second, some of you might have heard this passage before using the phrase, it is not good to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Used that way, dogs sounds like a pejorative, but a better translation is likely puppies, because the idea that puppies were allowed in the house when the children ate, whereas full-grown dogs would be kept outside. Puppies probably didn't have the connotations of cute and fun like it does now, but it did have the connotation of small and being allowed in the house. And finally, as you may have heard, it was unusual for man to even talk to a woman in public, and especially for a man to concede an important point to a lower-class woman. With that, a reading from the 15th chapter of Matthew. After a stern disagreement with the Pharisees and scribes about what makes a person holy, Jesus left the region of his childhood and went away to the foreign districts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that area came forward and cried out to him, Have mercy upon me, my Lord, son of David. My daughter is badly demon-possessed. But Jesus didn't answer her at all. Coming up to him, his disciples pleaded with him, Send her away. She's still crying out and following us. He answered, I was sent forth only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But the Canaanite woman came forward to him again and prostrated herself before him, saying, Master, help me. But in reply he said, It is not good to take the children's food and throw it to the puppies. She said, That's true, Master. Yet the puppies still eat from the crumbs that fall from their master's tables. Then in reply, Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is big. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed from that very moment. Thanks be to God for these words of life. Let us pray. Most blessed God, We thank you for this day once again. We thank you for the opportunity to be together. We thank you for knowing that there are those around us who share our desire to live by your word, to have that word guide our lives, although perhaps the word is also that into which we need to dig deeper, we need to struggle with, we need to understand better in order to get the blessing that is intended. We pray that you'll help us be a community that can honor this word with truth and with faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My junior year of high school, I had a couple of friends who were dating and ended up pregnant. I didn't know what was happening at the time because 
my friend who was pregnant had an abortion and went on with life. As a matter of fact, these two friends married not long after high school, and they are still married today and have had a wonderful life together. But there were some very difficult times in the days after the abortion. Somehow, word of her pregnancy and abortion got out among uh, our circle of friends and to the school at large, and she was cut off by many who, believing they were being true to their Christian faith, felt as if she needed to experience some kind of social ostracism as a kind of consequence of what she had done. Surely such actions must have consequences. Already at age 17, I knew that that was not my kind of Christian faith. I remained her friend and we even talked about Jesus occasionally. My friend was, you know, actually I'm not sure, but I think mildly Methodist, but she didn't know very much about the Bible. She generally thought that it said what our kind of like general society says that it says. If you're a good girl, God loves you. And if you do bad things, like get pregnant at 17 and have an abortion, well then, God loves you? Maybe not so much is the message that she heard. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that I was what we used to call a nerd, heaven forbid, but at age 17, I was already very interested in the Bible. Or maybe more accurately, no, definitely more accurately, I was already very interested in Jesus. With that distinction, I use the word the Bible to sort of represent the kind of Christianity that most people in America take for granted, or at least did in 1981. An emphasis on getting into heaven, on personal morality, on social conformity, on staying out of politics. By contrasting the Bible, understood in that way, with Jesus, when I say I wasn't so much interested in the Bible as I was interested in Jesus, by contrasting those two things with Jesus, I mean to say that I wasn't very interested in the civic religion of the white middle class. At 17, I was reading Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who exposed the problems of that kind of comfortable Christianity in the midst of the threat of Nazism in Germany in the 30s and 40s, who ultimately, of course, paid for that resistance with his life. And another guy named William Stringfellow, who used the message of Jesus to argue against the Vietnam War and racism and the persistence of poverty in the richest nation in the history of the world. So when I talked to my fallen friend about what she was experiencing from others, I talked about Jesus, not about the Bible. And Jesus? He's out there. He forgave a woman caught in adultery. He said, blessed are those who mourn. He said, get the log out of your own eye before you worry about the speck in another's. Now, I don't know how much it helped when we talked about these things, but 
She remained my friend. And at my 40th reunion a couple years ago, that couple were two of the people that I talked to the most. Now, all of that is really to give you a little bit of framework and to help you catch the, the meaning and significance of this. The teaching of Jesus was a colossal explosion of ethics in the world in which he lived. And his followers continued to deal with the fallout from that explosion throughout the New Testament. And indeed, that work continues today. You have to read the New Testament, you see, not as a, as a flawless presentation of the way and will of God, but as part of the struggle of Jesus' followers to figure out what that explosion of Jesus' teaching meant for them and for the world. Sometimes, like in the case of my 17-year-old fallen friend, you have to use Jesus to fight against the Bible, or at least those who use it for ostracism and exclusion. And that's what we're going to do this summer in this sermon series focused on women and the Christian faith. The truth, to put it mildly, is that Christianity has not always been entirely life-giving to women. Yet, women have found life-giving faith in Christianity. Our series this summer is going to try to honor the truth of both of those statements and live in the tension between them. In terms of my story from years ago, we're going to use Jesus to argue against some ways in which the Bible is presented. With a little more nuance, I might say that we're going to use the message of Jesus to undermine what has often been taught in his name implicitly or explicitly about women. We're going to try to work through the fallout of the colossal explosion of the ethics of Jesus as they reshape much of our inherited sense of Christianity in women. So today, to get to it, with the challenging story of the Canaanite woman who seems to teach Jesus a lesson about the nature of God's love and mercy. So let's boil this down to the two main characters, Jesus and this Canaanite woman. Sadly and typically, I'm afraid, for the patriarchal culture in which the Bible came from which the Bible came. We don't learn this woman's name, but I'm going to go ahead and call her Cana because I want her to have a name. I want us to think about her as a real person. As we read the story, Jesus is in the middle of his ministry in the Gospel of Matthew. He's in the middle of setting off this colossal explosion of his teaching. He's already taught that everything we have belongs to God, so we darn well better make sure that everyone has enough, lest their blood and bones call out to God for justice. He's already taught in the Gospel of Matthew that violence is not an option as you deal with aggression, but you have to find another way, a way that doesn't obliterate your enemy, but at least carries the promise of transforming them. And we're still trying to deal with the fallout of those parts of the teaching of Jesus today. 
Jesus also, we know at this point in the story, is geared toward bringing his message to his own people, the house of Israel, as it's called in the story, or as we commonly say, the Jews. Jesus is clearly focused on the home team throughout the Gospel of Matthew. I would say that there are signs in the Gospel that Jesus knows intellectually that God's mercy and love are for the whole world, but like a parent's unique love for their own child, Jesus has this unique love for the people of Israel. Then the other character is this woman, Cana. She is the other in so many ways. She's called a Canaanite, which is a term that makes her part of the people that Jesus and the Israelites have been fighting for like a thousand years. They were the original inhabitants of the land, displaced by the people of God, and they've been fighting in some ways ever since. She had a daughter who is possessed by a demon, which makes her spiritually unclean and just like questionable in so many ways. She doesn't have any male family members to rely on. If she did, the male family member would have been the one to go out and cry to Jesus for help. But she doesn't have any male family members to rely on, to speak for her as would be expected. So she carries some kind of shame. Was she kicked out of her family of birth somehow? She has no father around to help? Was she kicked out of her family because of a teenage pregnancy? And of course, she's a woman. Second class, third class, fourth class, no class at all, no position, no Identity of her own, as I said, she doesn't even have a name. And yet, out of a mother's love for her daughter, she approaches this mysterious man who seems to have control over the demons. Why not cry out to him in spite of all the reasons not to, her position, her gender, her nation. She has every reason to respect that barrier between them. But she's also got nothing to lose. And so she cries out to Jesus, have mercy upon me, my Lord, son of David. My daughter is badly demon-possessed. But Jesus didn't answer her at all. Now, we could protect the holiness and kindness of Jesus here. We could protect the divinity of Jesus, and maybe in a sense that's a fine thing to do, but let's live here for a minute with the humanity of Jesus. He didn't answer her at all. She pleads with him basically for the life of her daughter, and he's silent. He ignores her. What? What is she to do with me? He may be thinking. I came to awaken my own people to the way of God. I can't, I can't fix every 
problem, cast out every demon. And we can even imagine that the, that, that, that division, that barrier was huge. A foreigner, a poor, a powerless woman. Like, I, I especially don't have to help her. Maybe, though, maybe, though, it's the silence of confusion. Maybe it's the silence of the seed of change. Maybe Jesus' heart goes out to his woman. Maybe his heart goes out to his wo to this woman, to Cana, but maybe his heart is in conflict with his mind. I came for my own people. What has she to do with me? She cries out again and again, and the disciples, with the moral clarity that would be expected of men in that day, they do the classic human thing. They hoard the mercy of God. Send her away! She's crying out and following us. And then Jesus says, perhaps cruelly, but perhaps expressing the source of his confusion, I was sent forth only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. His, his mind and his heart seem not to be in the same place. But the Canaanite woman came forward to him again, and she prostrated herself before him, saying, Master, prostrated, you know, prostrated herself before him. And she says, Master, help me. And again, as if sort of to verbalize the struggle that he's feeling, Jesus says, it, it, it's not good to take the children's food and throw it to the puppies. It's not good to take the mercy that is intended for my own people and give it to others. Give it to just anybody. Give it to this particular just anybody. But then we hear it. The line that shakes Jesus out of his confusion, out of the struggle between his head and his heart. Cana says, that's true, master. Yet the puppies still eat from the crumbs that fall from their master's tables. And the explosion breaks forth, first in Jesus' heart, and then in his mind, and then in his words, and then in the world, the explosion of the mercy of God breaks forth. The unwritten words here, Jesus' unspoken words are this. Oh my God, I missed it at first. I couldn't see it. I felt it, but I couldn't see it. Your mercy, O oh God, is not just for my people, but for all. It's for everyone who cries out to you in need and hope. It's for all of the suffering and for all of those who love them. It's for anybody, even the just anybody of this Canaanite woman bowed down before me. And what does come out of Jesus' mouth are these words. A woman, your faith is big. You know, that's often translated into English as your faith is great. But that's, you know, 
that's the word great as in the word large. It's a, it's a great mountain. It's large faith is big. Let it be done for you as you wish. And from that moment on, her daughter was healed. This is what all of us need to know about the faith of women. Whereas the Bible, the tradition, the culture, the patriarchy, call it what you will, whereas almost everything tells them, tells you that you don't belong, that you should be sent away, that you are yet to be included in the full humanity that you deserve. You are yet called upon to roar. You are called upon to reach into the mess that is created by that explosion of the teaching and ethics of Jesus and claim it for your own. If the tradition tries to put you down, you claim the core of Jesus' message and you roar and you make it your own. But there you go. I've already done what I didn't want to do in this series, which is mansplain. Tell women how to experience the faith. And so actually what I want to say is it is up to the rest of us men or whoever carries positions of authority in this world, like pastors and others, for us to do the work ourselves, to do what we have to do, to claim not what our society has always taught us about the faith, but to claim Jesus and his explosive message, not a destructive explosion, but a, an explosion that recreates, an explosion that reshapes. Claim it and make it our own so that that poor Canaanite woman, Cana, doesn't have to bow down and plead for mercy for her daughter. Let's all be about the work of reshaping this tradition for the mercy of God, the love of God, the respect of God is for all. Thanks be to God. Amen.